Hello everyone. Today I wanted to uh, wrap up my journey through the films of Masaki Kobayashi, 11 films that he directed that are available either on um, Blu-ray, DVD, or on the Criterion channel. All of the movies that I've discussed, including today's movie, uh, are, are currently available to, to view on the Criterion channel if you have access to it. So I left uh, Kobayashi's uh, often termed as masterpiece, The Human Condition to Last. I skipped over it, and uh, chronologically speaking, uh, because I knew it was going to be, uh, it, it might be an ordeal. I'm not a fan of war films. Uh, I, I, I was when I was a kid, but in my old age, the, uh, the, uh, the war films, uh, war film fatigue has set in for quite a few years now. It's also a nine-hour movie. It's three three-hour-plus films. Uh, they were um, they were made um, in consecutive years. They would film for six months, take six months off for three consecutive years, and then they would, in fact, <clears throat> uh, be shown. Uh, in they were shown in three years. Now I I, I did about two weeks in between. <laughs> And uh, it was everything I, and knowing, having watched the other available Kobayashi movies, he, he is, I think, quite fairly to say he has a very bleak vision of life. Understandably so when you know about his personal life, but, um, and, uh, and the human condition I knew was going to be, I expected it to be unrelentingly grim. It certainly was. It, it was difficult to um, totally absorb uh, all the uh, of man's inhumanity to man. It, it, it's a. Uh, it's probably one of the most. Uh, uh, it's realistic. These things actually happened. It's based on a novel by a soldier in World War II, a Japanese soldier who was sent to Manchuria. And uh, in Manchuria, being colonized by the Japanese in the previous couple decades, and for expansion for their population, but also for the rich mining, the rich wars, uh, farm land. Um, so there were a lot of Japanese settlers there. And then when the war came, uh, he was sent, the, novel, the, the uh, man who wrote the novel uh, was sent to Manchuria, as was Kobayashi. So this is, this is a very authentic, as, as, as horrifying as it is, it's a very authentic uh, depiction of what the war was like. Now, um, Kobayashi was sent to Manchuria, but then he ended up, at the end of the war, he was, uh, near the end of the war, he was sent to an island outside the island of Okinawa. He always said that if he had been sent to Okinawa, he probably would not have survived. Uh, and they did bomb the island that he was, uh, he was stationed on, and many of his friends were killed, but he thought for sure if he had been on Okinawa, he would have never survived. And um, and this is uh, this uh, this three-part movie is a depiction of of a man called Koji, uh, who uh, Kaji actually not Koji, uh, who um, wants to resist. He doesn't know. He doesn't believe in the war. He's uh, a humanist. Uh, in the terms of Japanese political history, he would have been termed a socialist, perhaps even a communist, a red. But basically, what he is is a humanist, and uh, he was trapped in the historical forces of which he lived in, both Kaji um, and uh, Kobayashi and the novelist. They were trapped in this historical forces of militarism, nationalism, this idea that the individual has to be totally obedient to the society, to the emperor. Um, so, but what, what saves the film, and, uh, or at least mitigates some of the grimness of the film, is, um, is uh, Tetsuya Nakadai's monumental performance as Kaji. And uh, I mean, it's just an amazing performance, and and luckily we get a we get a really uh, good interview with him. I think it's from the early 2000s, and Nakadai is still with us today. And he describes what it was like, the ordeal, because he's in almost every scene, and they couldn't film in Manchuria. 
but they did film in Okaida, which was the northernmost island of Japan. So there was harsh winters there and where um, Kobayashi grew up, where his family lived. So we get this monumental performance from Nakadai. We get just fantastic direction by uh, Kobayashi. And, and now that I've seen all his available films, I'm just, I, I, I'm in awe of Nakadai and I'm all in awe of Kobayashi because his, his uh, visual, the form of the film, the visual imagery, um, it's just, and, and of course he believes it so much. He believes in these stories that he's telling, especially, obviously, the human condition. Now Kobayashi, when the war was over, he, he was a prisoner of war for about a year after the war was over in order to clean up army bases and to do work for the American army. So he didn't, he didn't have to, he didn't experience the ordeal that Kaji, um, uh, it, that Kaji experiences, especially in the, the, uh, the third part of, of uh, the human condition. And the other thing is the cinematography. And uh, Yoshio Miyajima, I believe his name was, and uh, I mean, this is widescreen black and white cinematography and it is absolutely gorgeous on this uh, Criterion release. I mean, it's just, a fantastic film to look at, but again, it's um, it, it 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 it's a tough one. It's a tough one, and I got I got to be honest with that uh, with, with you on that. Um, and Kaji, um, both Kobayashi and and the novelist uh, felt guilt over the fact that they did allow themselves to be drafted. Uh, they both of them, the novelist as well as Kobayashi, did not believe in the war, did not hated the military system. So Kobayashi's um, uh, resistance to this was to remain a non-com. Now he came from a wealthy family. He was he came out of an elite um, college, uh, and he was pressured to become an officer, but he refused it. He he didn't want to uh, experience the war at that level, uh, but he did become a good soldier, the best soldier he could be in order to survive this. And uh, he was known as one of the best marksmen in the Japanese army. So the first part of the movie, Kaji, uh, also not wanting to be drafted, also a humanist who does not believe in the society at which he has been born into, uh, it gets, he knows he's gonna be drafted and that's a death sentence. That's the way he looked at it. But the company he's working for had, was in Manchuria and they had mining uh, uh, mines that uh, were uh, uh, were very valuable to the war effort, and uh, so Kaji is offered a draft exemption if he goes to help manage this one mine where the labor force is is basically Chinese, the native Chinese uh, Manchu slaves. They're they're basically treated as slaves, and Kaji does everything he can from an audience point of view. You might think he's doing too much. He's unrealistic in in what in the in the lives he tries to save. Uh, part two, we get uh, we get about three hours in what it was like for a Japanese soldier in the barracks, which was insanely sadistic bullying, and this was not exaggerated. <laughs> so we and Kaji again is trying to save the weak. The, the, the people that are bullied the most, and Kaji himself has to absorb tremendous beatings because his humanist impulses just run totally counter to this male world of, of kind of sadistic bullying. And then the last part of the film is the war is basically over. Uh, we never really hear about the bomb, I don't think. Uh, but Kaji needs to survive uh, the army, the Red Army, the Soviet Union had been uh, neutral, had a new neutrality pact with Japan, but once Germany surrendered, uh, the Red Army amassed on the Manchurian um, uh, border, and Kaji was was uh, was at the border. That's where his he was stationed, and uh, eventually they do overwhelm the Japanese forces in northern Manchuria. Uh, so then we get we get these, uh, I mean, these scenes of just lost in the forest, lost everywhere. Where do we go? Uh, there's no army left. 
everybody, the Japanese soldiers are just stragglers now, and Kaji has this innate leadership ability and this, this uh, monumental um, uh, desire to survive the war. He's going to get back to his wife. And, and that's a very, that, that's the tender part of the, of the human condition is Kaji's relationship with his wife. Um, so, um, and I've also been talking about Kobayashi's films in relationship to Stephen Prince's fantastic book. I mean, if you have any interest in Japanese films, uh, Kobayashi is, this book is outstanding. Uh, Prince also wrote a book on uh, Akira Kurosawa. And he, um, he often um, compares Kurosawa uh, to Kobayashi. They were, they were very different. Uh, Kurosawa did not go to war. Um, he made films during the war. Um, and uh, he has a very, uh, Kurosawa, a more secular, materialistic outlook, uh, heroic, the heroic impulse in men. Um, and Kobayashi was sort of the anti-Kurosawa. He, he didn't, his viewpoint in, in life was spiritual. Uh, and uh, there are places where they, they kind of crisscross both Kurosawa and Kobayashi. Certainly in a movie like Akiru, there is a later film on available for streaming that Stephen Prince describes that's kind of like Kobayashi's um, Akiru. Um, <clears throat> but for Kobayashi, and, and Stephen Prince really goes into a great deal of depth on it, uh, Kobayashi was influenced both by Buddhism and uh, by Christianity. And uh, of course, I, Christian values are basically Western values, and Kobayashi was brought up uh, in 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 Christian beliefs. Uh, he, I believe, he was married in a Christian church, and he believed totally in the sanctity of the individual, um, and and concern for those weaker people who are being oppressed by the historical forces. Um, that uh, we're born into and that we have to learn how somehow to survive, which is basically Kaji's story. How do I survive this historical moment? How do I survive this oppression, this oppressive anti-human uh, machine um, of nationalism, militarism, the feudal past? You know, the whole society is, to, in Kaji's view, the whole society needs to be wiped away <laughs> as far as these kind of emotions that, that um, uh, especially the nationalism, militarism of the 1920s and 30s that existed um, in Japan. And uh, it, it's often seen that Kobayashi is talking about um, a specific moment in time this moment of militarism, this moment of nationalism, this moment of, of, of war and of man's inhumanity to man being the way of life. Um, so, and all his films are tinged by his experiences by the war, uh, it, it, uh, mostly overtly, but in, in, uh, they're, all, they're in every, every film that Kobayashi would make covertly. But uh, in, in, in Stephen Prince's book, um, he quotes uh, Kobayashi uh, in an interview that he gave uh, to a, um, a film critic, and he believes that the main theme of, uh, of the human condition, I quote here, is that the film treats the fundamental evil nature in human beings. The war was the culmination of human evil. I wanted to explore this dark side of human nature, and, and that, Certainly, that, that the essence of good and evil uh, in, in Kobayashi's work in the human condition is very much a Christian one. At least I can identify it. I'm not, I'm not any kind of um, expert in Buddhism, and, and, but Prince does bring out the Buddhist elements in his um, analysis of Kobayashi's films. But you see Kobe, uh, Kaji often as a Christ-like figure. Um, he's willing to sacrifice himself for other people. Um, and when he, when they're, uh, he and a band of, of, of his uh, fellow soldiers who survived the, uh, when uh, the battle where they were overrun by Russian tanks, 
they pick up people along the way and they follow Kaji. So you can't, you can't, um, I don't think that Kaji actually does represent Christ that, in, in that way, but you can't help feeling it at times. Um, so even though this is, this was, uh, I can't say it was a struggle because my respect for this movie is just absolutely awesome, the human condition. Now, as far as what's, what's my favorite uh, Kobayashi movie, it's kind of hard to say. There's only two other movies in Blu-ray, both on the Criterion channel, Harakiri and Kaidan, it's Ghost Story. Harakiri is a, uh, a film about the uh, Bushido Code um, that, that Kobayashi felt never went up from feudal times, never went away really, or at least it was revived in Japan in the pre-World War II era. And I don't, there's also four films on the Eclipse set. There's also Samurai Rebellion on DVD and the Eclipse set of course is, um, is also uh, uh, DVD. I don't have any of those, but I think my favorite Kobayashi is Black River. Uh, it's the film that preceded the human condition. It's a film that um, introduces Nakadai to the film world in his first uh, significant role. And uh, he was only, in, I think he was only like 24, so he's only in his, uh, his late 20s uh, during the human condition. And uh, Nakadai will go on to appear in almost every Kobayashi film. And at the end of his Kobayashi's career, when when uh, Kobayashi was having difficulty raising money and was frustrated and depressed. Uh, Nakadai and his wife, who was a screenwriter, they, they, they did their best to get projects going and Nakadai would of, of, often appear in, in fairly small roles considering, uh, along with uh, Toshiro Mifune, he was the major movie star in Japan during most of his life. But in, in Black River, it's sort of a condensed kind of view. It, it includes uh, some great performances, and um, especially by the women, the two women in the film. And I, I felt uh, the exhilaration of the tragedy that you could sometimes get in a Shakespeare uh, play. You know, Macbeth is, you know, everybody dies, but the, you know, you walk, like you've seen something special. And it was not in it. It, it, it was so condensed into this, and, and, and Kobayashi often did that. His films sometimes almost seem like theatrical. A part two of the human condition is basically you're in, you're in the barracks with a bunch of guys, and you see a whole lot of things going on in the barracks and right outside the barracks. Um, so that would, be, uh, that would be my favorite, and that's part of the Eclipse set, uh, Black River. Uh, where to start with Kobayashi? I would not start with the human condition. Now, again, I have no, uh, I have no uh, problem with uh, those who feel that um, the human condition is one of the greatest movies ever made. Uh, and, but um, I would say part of the, um, uh, some of the criticism of, of the movie is that, uh, that, that he lays it on. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unrelenting. But you know, another thing, uh, and I'm, I'm babbling on too long here, I didn't want to make this long of a video, but Nakadai also said that it, after the subsequent years, after the third, um, uh, the third, uh, 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 the third movie in, in The Human Condition came out, once a year a, a theater in Tokyo would play all three movies back to back at, at a theater, an all night showing, and they would, those, they would sell out it certainly has an incredible, I can't imagine what that would be like, but I would love to see, if I ever saw The Human Condition again, I would love to see it on a big screen. I think maybe Harakiri is, 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 the, is the movie to start out with, um, and perhaps Samurai Rebellion, but I think Harakiri uh, is, in Stephen Prince's view, uh, Kaidan, Harakiri, and uh, Samurai Rebellion are uh, Kobayashi as greatest, as most mature. Um, both stylistically and thematically. And I, I have no problem with that either, but for me, my favorite, Black River. Okay, that'll be about wrap it up. Um, again, um, uh, thanks for everybody who managed to listen to me this far. I hope I uh, was a little bit uh, enthusiastic on Kobayashi through all these videos that people will seek out his work. 
He's a great filmmaker, one of the greatest filmmakers who ever lived, in my opinion, at least. Okay, you guys take care.